Um, so just to start really, a bit of an overview of why we're doing all of this and the problems that we have. And I think all of these things we do understand. Climate change is so much on the agenda now. But the fact that, you know, towns and cities are on rivers, but we have water coming in all directions. Now, we can't deal with all of that. And clearly what we're trying to do is deal primarily with, with rainfall and what's actually, you know, coming that way rather than all these other things. But it is that combination of problems in terms of water that makes this such an important aspect for us to deal with. If we're going to do that, then we really need to think about it at all levels. So clearly we need all the policies there to support it, but we've got to think about every aspect of how we manage water in and around our towns and cities in particular, and looking at this land use planning. And we really do have to manage all water for new development and redevelopment if we are going to do that, as well as comprehensive retrofitting of floods, right, you know, right down to property level resilience. So that means we really need to up our game completely in what we're doing. So how do we deliver it? It's absolutely got to be done, in my view, by collaboration between design teams, by communicating amongst our design teams and with the other professionals that we're dealing with, as well as the public. And then we actually, the best way to do it also by working with our clients is by selling the benefits of what we're doing. That way we can try to get the win-win result that we're looking for in terms of you know, making this a real enhancement to development that we so badly need. So how do we sell those benefits, whether they're financial or not? Because I think understanding what SUDS can deliver is a key way to getting the whole design team to be mo motivated and focused on what they're trying to do. And there is guidance that tells us quite clearly or research that says houses are easier to sell and sell for higher prices when they're located near SUD systems. But more importantly, when I'm working with my developer clients, I think the key is that I can tell them quite clearly that taking this approach satisfies multiple planning requirements all in one go if we're actually going to take this integrated approach. Clearly, the importance of things like biodiversity net gain is um, becoming much more to the fore. The metrics are there in place already, and we're being asked to quantify this on schemes with the ecologists. It just makes all of that easier to achieve. But delivering multiple benefits really is cost effective and generally cheaper when you can keep them on the surface. So that makes the use of that land efficient. We can make it more attractive. And then we can also modify the environment as well in terms of excess heat and rainfall, as well as dealing with the day to day. So hopefully you will have all seen the four pillars of SUDS, which identifies the benefits that SUDS can deliver. And because this is in multiple benefits, we are really trying to do the best we can on every site from attractive, healthy places, right, that, which are unhealthier environments, so it's for making them relevant to the locality and in doing so, make, giving them inherent resilience and reusing rainwater effectively. We can improve water quality and, and support the aquatic environment. And I think we understand how important that is that these days. And on the biodiversity front, obviously, creating new habitats and networks. Just because the nature of suds being linear and the sorts of features that we're going to use will enable that to happen. And around this side, you know, look at this later, you know, the many things that we can actually add on as these extra benefits. So what we're trying to do is maximize those benefits, making places for people and wildlife to flourish. So this for me is really what it isn't. So let's get that in there early. Schemes that are badly designed, badly executed, we hear about things, you know, concerns about suds being dangerous. Well, they won't be if they're properly designed. But what we have on the top right is most definitely something that inherently is dangerous in its design. And when that fencing to save people from falling in and drowning collapses and is broken as it was there, it's even more dangerous. So let's avoid wherever we can with these sorts of things because that's the sort of thing that gives suds a bad name which is completely unnecessary and should be designed out. We need these things to be uh, easily maintainable, accessible and you know and attractive things not not ugly features in the landscape. 
So just quickly, there's a wide range of suds features at all scales. So really the choice of what you're going to do is very much dependent on you and your site and the locality that's there. And so at all scales, it's down to that personal interpretation of the designer and the design team to bring that together in a holistic manner. And really, even with urban retrofitting, there's lots that we can do in terms of the way that we manage that water, creating new urban water parks, as well as other features. Um, but we also do see very bad schemes. Now, I do apologise for, for this, because um, it's not a very good image. But this was a scheme that, that we've come across recently that really just is all about pipes going down to the bottom. And if you look at the bottom, again, it's not so easy to see. There is what's known as the typical bomb crater, which is just you know, a straight one in three slopes from existing ground levels right the way down to the bottom, which is both unsafe and unattractive and inappropriate in the landscape that was there. That perhaps gives a bit of a better detail. That is not enhancing anything in terms of amenity, and it certainly isn't going to do anything for biodiversity, and it is actually unsafe. We see a lot of this. It's unnecessary because there is the space to integrate that so much better. Um, so, you know, let's move on from there. The better is where we can then take schemes. So this was a scheme we've been involved in where there were some simple engineering drawings done to enable the quantities to be calculated. But the important thing is then to take those drawings and convert them into something that's more sympathetic to the landscape. So moving those on enabled bank gradings to actually, well, these, these are the basic ones showing the, the quantities but we need to move those on to show how they would be much better integrated into the environment so that we weren't creating um, the rather strange alien uh, regrading things where falling ground levels that fell quite steeply then needed to be banked up at, at steep gradients to actually give the quantities required. So just remodeling that, but still keeping with the quantities enabled us to then integrate within the environment in a way that was going to enhance it and make these spaces that people would want to use for their public recreation rather than these sort of slightly alien engineered um, features that otherwise we may get. So great for establishing the principles of volumes and attenuation and how we will deal with it, but it then needs that, that softer approach to actually show the design integration and make these appropriate places for people. And that's about the need for detail, to taking it in at times to that detailed level to just demonstrate how the simple engineering approach then becomes the, the design integrated approach, incorporating planting the ecology and all those other things to actually get those additional enhancements and of course the visual quality. So I'm now going to show you a scheme that we've been involved in and to just show how in this project um, integrated approach throughout the whole design team and so this is a substantial site and um, the, the one thing that perhaps is more unusual for the projects we work on is that in this instance we do actually have good infiltration rather than having to do huge amounts of attenuation storage but that isn't to say we didn't have troubles with, uh, with managing the water in the design. So what is it that we need to consider? Well, in terms of a general project, the baseline issues has got to start with, in this instance, does it flood and where and how does the water flow and how does the water discharge? Then the other things we were considering is the topography, the local landscape character, the historic context, which was important for the site. Obviously, the visual issues arising from development, the tree resource and the ecological resource. So those are pretty standard factors that one would want to consider on any significant development site. But then we also want to consider what makes it livable. So placemaking, creating that attractive environment, achieve the necessary access and connections for all the users, and then the, the provision for play and public open space and how we can bring those things all together. So as you can see, this site most definitely does flood uh, with a very large lump of flood zone two going around the site. And in fact, when the detailed modeling was done, 
coming into that uh, northeast boundary as well as the area, other areas that were shown. And you can see from that that there was obviously the, the hist historic context in the centre. So that was an important part in setting um, uh, the tone and the character for some parts of the site. We then looked at the planning designation. So we have a significant part of the conservation area coming through that site and a number of listed buildings, although they didn't have much bearing on what we were actually doing there. Key views, very important in terms of understanding what the visual envelope for the housing might be, where it might be sited, and the context of how we would use that vegetation, its quality and contribution that it currently makes, and how that influences the local landscape character. So detailed tree survey was undertaken, and you can see the outcome of that, which, which was not massively restricting. And generally speaking, um, there was not, not a great deal of uh, good quality trees, but moderately good quality trees, but important to retain. So we looked at all of those factors to see how they would influence the spatial design. And, and as you can see, the flooding clearly was a key, key determinant. The historic aspects of it, in terms of the conservation area and, and the longer history of the site were also important with the issues of visibility from the conservation area and how that influenced it. But also accessibility was very much key as to how we would access that with vehicles and how we would connect into the pedestrian routings. The, the ecology um, was, was not such a big factor. It was mainly around the old trees and as we said, we were seeking to retain the majority of those anyway, but plenty of enhancements potential there, because the site at the moment is, is partly in um, arable agriculture and partly to unmanaged grassland. So again, lots of potential to enhance what's there by working with there and reinforcing that. So that allowed us to start to define the developable area and how the, the routing and access around the site might work. So we need to start to look at that access and movement, how we would use the different parts of the site, particularly bearing in mind the areas that would flood, how they would contribute to the site as a whole, and how we would integrate those things together with the few existing public footpaths that were local to the site, and the connectivity to the, where the main users would be accessing that site. And again, that started to refine the development concept and, and to get those linkages and aspects of the site to be developed in the way that might be appropriate for how it was going to work. But in the main, we then came up with the concept of the different street typologies, and that came up with a central boulevard that would be the key access, picking up a number of those important existing trees in this broad boulevard where we could integrate them and have plenty of space to do so. The park edge where the housing would be outward facing and have the benefit of looking out straight onto the surrounding green space and direct engagement with that. And then the central zone, the houses that were in the inner part of the development area. And there we go, so that's then realising it and now you can see how we're making the space for water in this instance. So just the broad aspects of how we can take the water from the park edge outwards, we can provide um, infiltration basins in some of the larger spaces where the public open space would be, but even within that central boulevard still creating more space there to enable those roads to be attenuated and then looking at what we would do around the internal roads as they uh, came through. So the important part of that for us is working with the master planning architects to actually draw the site sections to understand the space required. So knowing that we're wanting to run the SUDS features along these roads to enable that space to be integrated in the road layout right from the very beginning so that you've got that space there in your main master planning approach. So then that's just showing you how that then works when we start to look at the housing layout along that central boulevard and how that, that space pans out in terms of the, the character and the visual terms of that street. Then secondly, along the path A at Park Edge, so you can see how we've worked from the, the existing street on the right hand side and the screening that was necessary that we wished to, to filter inward views across to 
the houses and how we would be draining the, the highways uh, around the park edge and the ability to provide that public open space and, and the enhancements to the ecology through those areas on the doorstep. And again, looking at how the housing related to that, so integrating those two together and starting to put together all those different parts within it. And then the internal central zone, where we're now in a much more dense urban um, setting, but again, just enabling that extra space to be there, pulling things apart a little bit to enable us to get those different aspects of storage and infiltration beneath the permeable paving, um, within the bar retention planters on rain gardens, and taking water from the houses and the roads. And again, that housing layout and how that would work. And this is just to show you that, you know, this is the, the engineering model that was produced for that. So as I showed you on that previous scheme, just giving those basic spatial arrangements, but enabling the quantity and volumes and how that would work to be, to be resolved in principle, and then enabling us to refine those features at the detailed design stage to get that better design integration. But we know there's the space to do all of that. And that's just a question of really developing detailed design at the later stage. And so again, just showing you a bit more of the detail there, how for, at the property level, all of those things link up, join together and are collected up. So that's the final master plan. And the important part of that is really just to see how that development parcel has now been integrated within the site. We're allowing the existing flood flows to be accommodated on the site and attenuated. We've respected the historic context, the trees that are there. We've done major enhancements to the ecology and, and what's there. And at the same time, created new community parks, created um, sports facilities, play spaces, and worked with local people to understand their needs in terms of um, accessibility to an area that currently is not available to others. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, great, great presentation. We've got some time for questions. Uh, I'm just wondering whether there are any questions. There's a number of questions there that people couldn't necessarily see the screen, but Bear with me, I hope that's resolved. Okay, I, I suppose, so one question I, I, I have for you is, during the course of this uh, process, what's your relationship been like with the engineers that have been involved in the project? Um, I think every time we work with a new set of engineers, I think we just make a real effort to have conversations with them around um, the approaches we'd like to take and how we can work together. Um, so, you know, and generally speaking, that's fine. I mean, I think there can be some, you know, interprofessional tensions about that, but it really is important to have early conversations and, and share ideas and to even, you know, I have in the past, even at design team meetings, done a little presentation on um, integrating SUDs and approaches to SUDs that we like to take to just you know, make sure that everybody understands and is motivated and, and, under, and understands what we're trying to achieve. And I think if we can have those conversations and, you know, share that information, then, then things move on well. Great, thank you. Just see if there's any other questions before I move on. Okay. Uh, so I've got one question, which is always, a common one and quite useful is how do you avoid the use of attenuation crates as the only subcomponent? <laughs> um, just do what we've done, really. I mean, clearly, there are sites where space is very limited where there may need to be an element of that, but I've never yet come across a site where we can't actually integrate. Um, some soft suds. I mean, clearly, if you're trying to do something in a very dense urban area, then it may be that the only place you can do anything sensible is on the roof. But, um, you know, I think you just have to be creative in your thinking. But it is about 
starting to think about it right from the very beginning. So yes, crates may be necessary, you know, they are a component, but they shouldn't be the go-to just because it's easy to design. That's, that isn't going to, that is not suds. That's just sticking it in a crate. Great, thank you for that question. Thank you for the answer, Sue. So, uh, they're coming thick and fast now. Uh, there was a question earlier on about how was adoption dealt with with regards to uh, the green elements. Sorry, how was the what dealt with, Paul? Adoption. Adoption. Um, yeah. Well, we're, we're not quite at that point yet, but clearly the issues that are happening with water companies with SERS for Adoption 8, then really, I think on housing sites, this is the area where there is the scope to be talking to water companies to actually do that maintenance. I think in this instance, because we do have infiltration here, so it can, the water can all be managed on the site, it is much more about the uh, um, adoption and maintenance of the whole of the public open space that's here. And actually in this instance, it is all going to be set, it is being set up within a trust. So in that instance, it's not required. But I think on other sites where you're um, attenuating rather than infiltrating, then the ability to have discussions with water companies to, to have things adopted by them as from April next year is going to be a big step forward. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that question. And thank you for the answer. The question from Joe Bradley here is like, does Sue find the designers push back against us uh, and they wanting, with them wanting more density of development? Well, I think, you know, I think it really depends. I do feel that, you know, there's a lot of schemes we work on where at the moment things like verges are still provided on the main streets for tree planting. And, you know, those are not being used for suds in the way that they could be. I think we just have to have conversations between um, engineers, between NHBC, in highways to actually look at the way we can use space most efficiently on schemes because it is a complete waste if we are not integrating these things properly. We do still have challenges to overcome in that respect. Yes, I do understand about density, but you know, we are going to we have green infrastructure, we have got biodiversity net gain and the requirements to do that. If we're improving biodiversity, then we must be able to deal with water because those two things can go hand in hand. So I totally understand the issue of densification, but we have to see, and I think that's why allocating space early on in the scheme is so important. And I think the way we work with some of the, um, the end things, the ponds, the attenuation features, if we could do more upside within the development, then we could make so much more of those, those end of pipe solutions, which are very demanding on space, but needn't be if we'd integrated it better throughout the development. Okay, 